Well, I think we had a good day here at the, uh, at the Missouri House. We uh, debated it for, what, close to two or three hours? Three hours. And uh, I think you got what we thought you would get. You've got an economic development bill that I think really could make a difference in the state of Missouri. You've got some tax credit reforms with some of the amendments. You've got some tax cuts in there. Uh, we still believe the net savings of the, of the bill is, is a net positive. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, with the Republicans and Democrats, you know, we disagreed on some amendments. But at the end of the day, I think we had, uh, you know, 90-something votes for the bill. We had a little over 100 for the emergency clause. So I guess there were a few people that were gone. But uh, we think this is a step in the right direction. We look forward to the Senate taking it up and passing the bill. Steve, you've said in the past that you didn't want to go to conference, but if the Senate asks to go to conference, are you now willing to do so? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think it makes sense to go to conference because they can just take up the bill and pass it, and we can all save a day or two. But at the end of the day, if they feel like that there's a few things in there that they can't, uh, can't accomplish or can't deal with, then, then clearly the House has always been willing to work with the Senate. So you're now open to that. What? Yeah. You voted for it. Explain why a jobs bill should include a corporate tax cut. Well, I think as a general rule, what we did is they took the savings from some of the tax credit reforms uh, and, and, and distributed it back to, to businesses across the state. And the philosophy is is that you know if the if the corporate tax rates less, if the businesses have more money, they can hire more people. It's just a philosophical thing. Uh, we'll see what the Senate says about that. Um, you know, it, it, it was one of those things that just popped up on the House floor. It's not something that was in the original bill. Uh, as a general rule, if you have a, uh, uh, an amendment or a bill that decreases taxes on individuals or businesses, I'm just naturally going to be for them. And I would say that's probably the case with, with my caucus. So uh, I'm not sure if that's going to make it through the entire process, but it was one of many votes we took today. But and you had been stressing the importance of staying with the agreement. Does this break the agreement you had with the governor? <laughs> uh, the break the agreement we had, uh, that, that agreement was broken about four weeks ago. Uh, the House was readily uh, uh, prepared to send back the agreement that we agreed upon on July. Uh, I asked the uh, Mayor Pro Tem, if, uh, if uh, President Pro Tem Mayor, if we should send the agreement. He said there's no way he could pass it, so there's, there's no way that we were going to just send it just after he said already told us, hey, that we can't pass it. So, no, I mean, I think uh, I think the agreement was broken by the governor whenever he made the call to special session that was broader than what the agreement was. It was secondarily broke uh, by the Senate when they couldn't pass what they said that they could pass. And so I think the House has been the one body that's actually done everything that we said we were going to do. We sent them three bills. Uh, they haven't acted on any of them. They sent us three bills, and now we've truly agreed two of them without amending them and sent them the third one. So I, I'm pretty confident uh, that if you look at the facts, we the House has been pretty steady. The land assemblage language in this bill, um, it was clear there was a lot of sentiment on the floor um, to stress on your both, both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. with, with this expansion. I, I don't. I don't. I don't consider it an expansion. We're not changing the overall cap in the program, and we're making other people eligible for it. I would say that if you're if you're opposed to a program, that one person is uh, or one group is the only ones that are eligible for it, and then somebody offers a solution that other people could be eligible for it, but but not changing the camp, cap. You can't look at that as an expansion. I think it's just a matter of fairness. Uh, so I, I think there's no reason why the Bannister Project uh, that could bring Teva Pharmaceuticals uh, and and really redevelop an area that, that I grew up in, that I'm very familiar with. And uh, I think it was uh, a reasonable thing to do. And I, and I would tell you that if it becomes law, no longer will you have one group eligible for distressed land assemblage. Well, you'll have more than one, and we didn't change the overall cap. But, you but do you one, dispute you that Paul? You have one developer who's already received $28 million in tax credits, in part because of interest payments he's making. You've now given him the ability to just service that debt in perpetuity and continue to, to claim tax credits rather than the original deal he made with the legislature. The, the, the overall cap has not changed, and by allowing somebody else to participate in it, it's a net loss to the gentleman you're referring to. And there's no other way you can make it. Because, because if, if, if no one else is qualified for it, he will be the only one that will be eligible to receive up to the $95 million cap. 
by bringing other people into it, it actually reduces his ability to get, to garnish or to garner those tax credits. So there's no way you can slice it, Rudy, except that I'm sure he wasn't thrilled by the vote today. The state is, pay, is but, giving half the credit. No, no, no I'm going okay. to go jump ahead. in on Rudy's question a little bit. I don't want to interrupt Rudy. No, you guys can do, go at do, it. Do you, do, you accept, <laughs> do you accept the, the McKee? gains out of this version of the No, I'd say he, he, he certainly doesn't gain. I'd say I, if you don't change the cap and you allow somebody else to participate in it and they are going to pull away from the, the, the cap, there's, I don't see how you could slice it that you would think he would uh, have a net benefit in this. Not governor, at all. The governor, though, specifically but, said he didn't want this being dealt with. Well, I'm do sorry. You, you know, listen, the, I, I'm not going to do everything the governor tells me to. You know, and he doesn't do everything that I tell him to. And, uh, I'm, you know, if he gets a jobs bill that has this in there and he wants to veto it because of it, that's going to be his decision. Uh, but uh, we're going to run the legislative body the way we see fit, and he should run the executive branch the way he sees fit. Why should taxpayers pay half the cost of somebody's land purchases and all their interest costs and not end up with an ownership interest? Well, I mean, the, the reality is we passed distressed land assemblage, what, three or four years ago? And uh, I would say that a lot of people, and I think it could transform the north side. And I think it could make a tremendous change. But I would say if you had the same vote now, you might come up with a different result. But the program's there. Nobody offered an amendment to get rid of it. And so what we did is we, have, we had language in there that would make more than one person eligible with not changing the cap, which I think is reasonable. I mean, we can, we can disagree maybe on the merits, but that's where we're at. That's what we passed. Is it, is it your interpretation that by expanding this, this effectively shuts the door and McKee get more money from the taxpayers? No, I just think it makes more people eligible for it, uh, which I think is a good thing. And, uh, and by not changing the overall cap, I think it's not costing the taxpayers any more money. It just allows other people to be uh, to, to be eligible for it. And if you sit down and visit with a group that's looking at developing Bannister Mall, uh, they think they can get one of the largest uh, 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 generic drug manufacturers in the world there. It would really transform that area, which when I was a kid, it was probably one of the nicest parts of Kansas City. And so uh, we thought it made sense. And, you know, it'll go to the Senate, and we'll see what the Senate thinks. Of course, it becomes moot if they don't take it up. Um, yeah. Have you had any talks with uh, with mayor or anyone over there today? No, I mean, uh, I have not. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're going to have a chance to have an opportunity to look at it and read it like we did their Senate bill. And, and you know, if they if they feel like we do, uh, then they should take it up and pass it. And if they've got problems with provisions in it, then I'm certainly open to talk to them. Overwhelming majority of this chamber voted no sunsets on the two big tax credit programs does that make a bill that includes sunsets debt on arrival in this no, chamber I, uh well yeah i mean i've always told you that that the body as a whole uh, had concerns with sunsets and and the other side of the building i think doubted our our, our position on sunsets and uh and I think this shows you that it's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. We just feel like the system's broke over there. And, and to make a case that things should be based off merit, but then never allowing a bill to have a vote uh, to determine whether it's merit is, is not logical. And, and I do believe that with the help of John and Tim and Shane and Ryan, we've got an alternative that I think might work. And that's uh, the House Joint Resolution. Uh, Ryan, which number is it? One. One, which basically... Uh, would force the General Assembly uh, every four years to have an up or down vote in both chambers to determine whether uh, you get rid of a program or not. So if you really want tax credit programs to be reviewed, if you really want to determine a merit, then you shouldn't be afraid to have an up or down vote in both chambers so that one person, not the speaker, not the majority leader, not one of 34 senators could kill a program without a vote. Two, uh, two. So. I'm sorry. No. Two, two weeks ago, Rob Mayer said, dead on, used the phrase dead on arrival to describe a bill that would come over in the Senate without sunsets. With the magnitude of the vote you got to keep sunsets out, is a sunsets bill well, dead I, on arrival no, in well, the House? Well, yeah, I mean, we are not going to take sunsets. I mean, not the way they currently work right now. But what, I, what we would do is take a proposal like uh, that Representative Sylvie has, which assures that not one person could kill a program and that each program would have an opportunity to prove their merit and have an up or down vote. Now, if the Senate wants what they say they want, which is a review of tax credits, determine whether they have merit and whether they should continue, then they should love this because not only does it guarantee a vote, but it also does the review in half the time. Instead of seven years, it's four. So we're going to find out if they really want what they say they want. Can you walk us through that process? How would that work? Ryan? Sure. Well, 
I mean, basically what it does is it sets up a timetable and it says every four years um, there will be a requirement for the bill to be filed by the majority leader of the House and the majority leader in the Senate on day one, first legislative day. Then it will have to be referred to committee um, by day, I think, five. I, I'd have to look again at exactly what the time frame is. Then, um, then it will be kicked out of committee. Even if the committee refuses to vote, it will come to the floor and there will be a vote on it. Um, it says placed on the calendar for immediate action is, is the, the terminology in the bill. So essentially, as the speaker said, what we want to do is provide this oversight function, but provide it in a way that requires an up or down vote so you see a, what a majority of the chambers feel, not what one or two senators happen to think, or the speaker for that matter, so as he said. Majority vote would, would eliminate a program? Yes. Yes, if you wanted to eliminate a program, you would do it with a constitutional majority. In both chambers. Just like it takes a constitutional majority to create a program, we think it should take a constitutional majority to kill one. How does that change current law? The majority of the House, Senate can kill a program now. Well, because it forces the action, which takes it out of the hands of one or two senators to filibuster. It puts a timetable in the Constitution of when these things have to be done. So if the voters agree with us that we should have this open process and that we should have it uh, decided by a majority of the chambers, then the Constitution will dictate you have to do it by whatever day. And, and it addresses concerns from both sides. The Senate, right now you could send and set a program this year if you wanted to file a bill and make it through the process and get rid of it. They don't, the people who are in the Senate say they don't like that because the Speaker could just not have a vote and therefore it would not work. The, the House says, you know what, we don't want a program automatically sunsetting because we're not assured you can get a, a vote to continue the program because one person could kill it. This addresses both concerns. It does it more frequent than what the Senate wants, and uh, I think it's good government. It'd be hard to argue how this isn't better government than uh, the sunsets the way they currently well, and exist. Let, and let's... The point is that, the, um, is that the one or two senators can block a vote on or on their, block the review vote. I mean, or is it, does it force an the Constitution would the, the, consti vote the Constitution would dictate that by day, and I have to look at what specific day we put in, it would be placed on the calendar for immediate action. So at that point, um, you know, and it gets filibustered. Then what? Well, then um, you, know. you know, and and I think I, you know, and I think the committee is going to work through this. I think that there is a way that we can force a vote, and the committee's working through that. Uh, because we want to have a vote. We want to have an up or down vote, and, and if you really want uh, to determine the merit of a program, that's what everybody should want. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that is probably an avenue that could maybe bridge the gap. Because clearly, I think you saw the will of this body. 130-something to 17 voted that sunsets do not work the way the Senate operates right now. By that same I think the, I, same, no. well, I think the point here is that obviously the sunsets have become a big issue between the House and the Senate philosophically. What we're trying to do is interject a new solution that has not been contemplated to this point and try to break the law jam. It, you, you saw from the discussion on the floor that the low-income housing and historic preservation tax credits have bipartisan support. And wouldn't this amendment effectively make it almost impossible to eliminate those programs if being that it has no it, well no I mean basically every four years each each uh, program would have to determine its merit and a majority of the bodies could make a determination and I think that's probably how it should work if you want oversight if you want to determine uh, programs based off the merit let a vote occur and let members vote their conscience and what they think's right I think that's actually how the system should work the other alternative is is letting one or two people dictate where their program stays around that's not good government it's not something the house is going to accept